this uh, bill gives uh, clearer direction uh, uh, in terms of uh, when a prosecution is appropriate. And uh, again, one of the areas that we have clarified is uh, that uh, you don't actually have to catch the person in the act of doing the criminal act, that if you catch that person within a reasonable period of time and uh, you are unable to, uh, uh, to obtain uh, police assistance, uh, again, we've clarified that area and that's exactly what the bill now says. All right, Justice Minister Rob Nicholson responding to a question from Sun News Network about the issue of people like Ian Thompson. Will the new Lucky Moose bill, the one that says that you have powers of citizen arrest and the ability to protect yourself and your property, stop people like Ian Thompson from being prosecuted? Nicholson kind of hemmed and hawed and kind of, well, maybe, gee, swell, wouldn't it be great? But it wasn't a definitive yes. I want to turn to Solomon Friedman, one of our resident experts on issues surrounding firearms law, and ask him what he thinks. Uh, we'll get to another issue in a moment, Solomon. But I wanted to ask you about that. That was just today. Uh, the justice minister said this. And uh, Sol um, uh, Ian Thompson, of course, prosecuted for pointing a gun and, and firing warning shots to protect himself. I think that could still happen. You? I, I agree. I mean... We've seen a good first step in terms of the uh, conservatives. What really is a restatement of the self-defense law and, you know, putting it all in one provision and clarifying it slightly. But I've said from the very beginning, and I'll say it again, when it comes to self-defense prosecutions like the Ian Thompson case, the problem isn't with the legislation. The problem isn't with the case law. The problem is with the police laying the charge in the first place and with the prosecution in turn prosecuting that person in a court of law. Those are policy issues, not legislative issues, and that's what needs to change. Yeah, and until they get the message of back off, I think that they'll keep going on. Look, there's another issue surrounding firearms that just has me laughing. Uh, because the opposition, uh, the media party, you know, it's hard to tell them apart sometimes, and some NGOs are very upset at the Harper government because the United Nations is having its uh, global gun-grabbing conference, the attempt to start uh, the uh, arms trade treaty talks again. They kind of failed last summer. They want to get them going. And there is outrage that, once again, Canada is including a representative from the uh, gun owners. They would call them the gun lobby. I'll call them gun owners. Here's a quote from Kenneth Epps. He's with Project Plowshares. It's a um, religious NGO that works on uh, disarmament issues. And they say, to be narrowly focused on the domestic concerns of a minority of Canadians at a time when there are millions of people around the world affected by armed violence is clearly not what most Canadians want the Canadian government to be doing. I'm not sure how we arrived at that, but um, we're talking about the Canadian uh, Shooting Sports Association going on this. I think having uh, a voice for gun owners at a gun control conference is not a bad idea. Well, I think, you know, the, the, the first issue there is there's no such thing as the Canadian gun lobby. There are organizations that represent the interests of law-abiding Canadian citizens who want to own and use firearms safely and responsibly. That's the first thing. The second issue is really a fundamental one in terms of what is Canada doing at the United Nations? Canada, of course, is a country that has a democratically elected government. That government gets its mandate from the people. And obviously this government feels that the Canadian public do not want additional onerous restrictions put on gun owners, and they want that view advanced on the world stage as well. I don't see anything inconsistent between the two, and I, I disagree fundamentally with Mr. Epps. It, it is a bit strange, though, to watch this, because uh, when there's an environmental conference, the government will take environmental activists with them and they'll say well we're, we want to hear from this group whatever this group i won't use any examples in case i get the wrong one you know they don't take greenpeace but they take a responsible environmental group and they take them as part of their delegation and they talk with them during the the summit and say okay are we hitting the right notes are we not what are you hearing uh, it's kind of a sounding board for the government officials that are there it's all fine and good when it's uh, the watermelons of the green movement, the watermelon socialists to go along, but they don't like it when it's somebody advocating for responsible firearms ownership. Well, you know, I think this is a perfect case in point. You know, prior to the last round of negotiations, there were parliamentary hearings about the arms trade treaty, about Canada's role there. I testified at those, at those hearings. Mr. Torino of the CSSA testified, as did Mr. Epps. And of course, he had no issue there being included. We, we want our government to be informed by the opinions of experts, but most importantly as well, by the opinions of stakeholders. And I think it's completely disingenuous to be perfectly happy to be included in one round of negotiations or one round of consultations, but to be somehow off-put when Canada is taking into account, like in this case, the interests of stakeholders who could be profoundly affected by an arms trade treaty.
Now, Canada did put forward at the last uh, UN gun grabbing event uh, the idea that uh, sport shooters and hunters should be exempt from whatever regulations come forward. And that wasn't exactly welcomed by the, uh, the mandarins that walk the UN hallways. What's your read on what the UN's trying to do? My read is they want to set up a global gun registry. They want to be in control of even arms trading between uh, civilized countries like Canada and the United States. This is more than just keeping it out of the hands of rebel groups and dictators. Well, let me give you an example that really illustrates what I think the focus of many, not all, but many of the proponents of the arms trade treaty is. In, in the previous draft, there would have really been a blanket prohibition against transferring arms to quote-unquote non-state actors. And let's think about that for a moment. Brian, you're a non-state actor. I'm a non-state actor. Under a wording like that, it would actually be prohibited to transfer firearms to anybody who is not a government. Now, Canada lobbied hard against that and, and, and refused to sign on to anything that didn't use language like, you know, illegal armed groups. Of course, we understand that, you know, funding illegal, you know, arming illegal re rebels, rebel mm -hmm. groups, that's problematic. But from its very inception, this arms trade treaty was about keeping firearms out of the hands of non-state actors. That includes law-abiding, responsible citizens, like, you know, the members of many gun advocacy organizations, gun owners organizations in Canada. And I think that really lets you know in what direction the proponents of the Arms Trade Treaty are going. It's not a matter of wanting responsible firearms ownership. They don't want civilian firearms ownership at all. All right. Solomon Friedman, good talking to you. We'll chat again soon. Pleasure.